Good afternoon. Welcome once again to our webinar series entitled Frontline Report, Autoimmune Liver Disease and the Pandemic. Again, this series of webinars are made available via collaboration between the Autoimmune Hepatitis Association and the Center for Autoimmune Liver Disease in Cincinnati Children's Hospital. I'm Craig Lammer, the Executive Director for the Autoimmune Hepatitis Association and an adult hepatologist at Indiana University. I'm once again excited to help host the sixth webinar in our series entitled Top 10 Summer Activities, Know the Risk. Quickly, a disclosure from the AIHA. This webinar series does not replace your primary physician, gastroenterologist, or hepatologist. We cannot diagnose, treat, or manage symptoms associated with AIH. Summer is almost officially here, and as indicated by our title for this webinar, we'll spend most of our time trying to understand the risk for coronavirus infection during many of your favorite warm weather activities. Not only do we have our adult audience in mind, but in the second half of the webinar, we'll address many of the activities that our kids are excited about as well. We're lucky to have Dr. Kritika Kupali joining us today. You'll learn more about her from our moderators, but as an infectious disease and public health expert, she is the perfect guest to help us navigate the possible coronavirus risks this summer. Moderating our discussion today will be Aaron Anderson and Christine Browner. You know Aaron as the AIHA's Director of Programs and Advancement, and Ms. Browner as a strong advocate for pediatric autoimmune liver disease research and education through a number of organizations. Before we dive in today, I wanted to review an autoimmune hepatitis and coronavirus specific update. As we discussed in prior webinars, it's currently unknown if patients with AIH with or without advanced liver scarring on immunosuppressants are at a high risk for severe infectious complications of SARS-CoV-2 virus also known as COVID-19. In a recent report of COVID-19 outcomes in patients with chronic liver disease in two international liver registries, there was an overall mortality rate of 12% in chronic liver disease patients without cirrhosis, compared to 24% or higher in liver patients with cirrhosis. As we await larger international collections of AIH patients with COVID-19, my research AIHA member groups online to better understand COVID-19 symptoms according to AIH-related risk factors and those not related to AIH, such as advanced age, obesity, or etc. We collected 420 qualifying surveys over two weeks in May 2020 and found that 48 or 11 percent of patients completing this survey had symptoms that were consistent with COVID-19 and 89% did not during implementation of local U.S. stay-at-home orders. And this is what we found, and I want to alert you that this is yet unpublished. There was no demographic differences between two groups of AIH patients with or without symptoms suspicious for COVID-19. There was no difference between AIH treatment regimens nor fibrosis level among these two groups as well. Risk factors that have been associated with a higher risk of severe illness from COVID-19 were compared, and only BMI, more than 40, was more likely to be observed in AIH patients with symptoms of COVID. The only other significant risk factor included exposure to work contacts with COVID-19-like illnesses. Among AIH patients reporting COVID-19 symptoms, 25% had no identifiable home or work contacts with COVID symptoms, and in fact, eight AIH patients with COVID-19 symptoms either worked from home or did not work and had no symptomatic home contacts. A cautious takeaway message, at least in this data, it appears that immune suppressants used for the treatment of AIH did not necessarily increase the risk for severe COVID-19 illness. These findings are consistent with observations of prior coronavirus epidemics such as MERS and SARS. But again, I caution that we need much more data. And with that, I'll hand it over to Aaron Anderson, who will introduce Dr. Kupali. Thanks, Aaron. Thanks, Dr. Lammer. We're thrilled to have Dr. Kritika Kapali, an infectious disease physician, here with us today. During the COVID-19 pandemic, Dr. Kapali serves as a subject matter expert for the San Francisco Department of Health, and she's also the medical lead for one of their alternate care sites. She's been involved at the national level with the development of policy initiatives related to COVID-19 and pandemic preparedness. Thank you so much for being with us today, Dr. Kapali. Thanks for having me. 
Before we jump into discussing summer activities, I think it's probably important to briefly discuss risk factors. Could you review some of the known risk factors for severe cases of COVID-19 that may be important for patients to be aware of as they evaluate whether they should participate in various summer activities? Sure, I think that's a wonderful uh, question. So we know that people who tend to be at greater risk for COVID-19 are those that are greater than the age of uh, 65, those who have other comorbid medical conditions. So things like uh, diabetes or high blood pressure or um, coronary artery disease or uh, other medical problems. Um, however, that being said, we have seen people who are younger uh, also develop significant uh, adverse events from COVID-19. So when I say that people who are older are at greater risk, uh, we are still trying to learn uh, what other factors may put people at risk in general for COVID-19. Can you also share what we know about liver disease and cirrhosis as risk factors for COVID-19? Sure, um, unfortunately we really don't know that much yet. Uh, I think that even though it might feel like we've been in this uh, pandemic and in this disease for a really long time, in actuality, we're still in the early days of this disease. We've only known about it for about five and a half months now. So uh, we're still learning about what people with things like liver disease and cirrhosis and other comorbidities, uh, how they do, how they react to the uh, infection. And so that's information that really is still needing to be learned. Our understanding is that being on immunosuppressants is not a huge risk factor. Are you able to comment on that at all? Um, I think, again, I would be hesitant to say that somebody who's on immunosuppressants is not a huge risk factor. I think, um, you know, one of the things we are still not 100% uh, sure about at this point is uh, if we can lump all of immune suppressants in the same category because different immune suppressants work in different ways. And so I think until we know more about uh, the various immune suppressants, uh, I personally would be hesitant to categorize them all in the same uh, family. Sure, we can definitely appreciate that. Um, I'm also curious with the warmer temperatures and sunshine, what is the impact of heat and humidity on the spread of COVID-19? We know these things play a role in how quickly the virus breaks down on surfaces. So just curious what your, what your thoughts are. Sure, um, so there is um, a recent article that came out that uh, humidity and heat might affect the how long the uh, virus might be able to live. However, I think that overall, again, if you look at what's going on in the world, uh, you know, we see that people who live in places where it's hot routinely, uh, we still see cases um, that are in large quantity. So if you look at places like uh, India and uh, Brazil, where it's still very warm, um, we're seeing record numbers of cases. So I think uh, when you think about uh, transmission of the virus and uh, how, how that could affect uh, uh, the transmission dynamics, uh, again, that, those are things we're still trying to figure out. So I think, um, I wouldn't say, oh, the, it's going to be warmer and the virus is going to go away um, in the summer because we know that in places where it's hot, we're still seeing a lot of cases. That's good to know. Um, now let's talk about summer activities. We've had a number of emails from patients and families talking about their wonderful summer plans and are, they're, they're really curious if they are still safe given we're in the middle of a pandemic. Um, Many families are looking forward to summer barbecues with friends. For those of us in the United States, the 4th of July is right around the corner, and patients are wondering if it's okay to make plans with, with family and friends. Um, I'm curious how risky are outdoor barbecues? Sure, so I think that, you know, one of the things I tell patients and people in general is that it's really hard to give overarching recommendations. So every, um, uh, activity, you need to think about your own risk factors, the risk factors of the people you're going to be with, and also what you're doing. Uh, so uh, 
the example I give is that the 65 year old with no medical condition is not the same as the 65 year old who has diabetes and is not the same as the 65 year old with uncontrolled diabetes. So you really need to think about um, all those factors and you need to think about your own risk factors as well, um, who you've been around recently uh, and you know, could that person have been sick and gotten you sick? Uh, that being said, I think um, even with the barbecue, you need to think about, okay, uh, where am I going to be? Am I going to be in an area that's outdoors? Typically barbecues are outdoors. Um, if you're going to have a barbecue, maybe have it in your backyard where you can maybe appropriately physically distance yourself from people, but you're going to be with people that you know versus in a place where there might be lots of people uh, around where you might be around people you don't know. Uh, I would also recommend um, continuing to wear a mask even if you're outdoors uh, so uh, you can protect other people in case you are sick um, and you can protect yourself. Uh, so my inclination would be to try and stay at home, have that barbecue at home. Um, if you, you can't for whatever reason and you need to be at a park or a beach, uh, try to be in a situation where uh, you try and um, have yourself off to the side away from people. Uh, again, try and have it with people um, that you know um, and also limit the number of people that you're around with. That's great information. Um, what about food? At a barbecue, would you recommend that families bring their own food and cook their own food and, and, and keep their food just to their immediate family? Or is it okay to have a group gathering where people bring food to share? Yeah, so I think as much as possible, uh, you would want to try and have uh, portions that you can have for yourself. Again, you know, we worry about people um, sharing food uh, again for two reasons. One, uh, and it's not just for COVID, it's for other infections, right? So when people are touching food uh, with their hands that might not be clean, uh, you can uh, transmit infections. And also, um, again, if you're picking, you want to make sure people are not uh, potentially spreading infections via their um, drop mouth via droplet. So you would definitely want to make sure people are covering their mouth when they go around the food. Um, and it's one of the reasons also that, you know, in restaurants and things like that, they've eliminated things like buffets and stuff um, because we don't want food standing out and lots of people handling the food. So as much as possible, um, you know, things that can be done in individual portions that um, before you get there that so then maybe then people can just pick up that individual portion um, would be the best. Another question related to um, hosting a gathering at homes that our, our patients have is, is it okay to let someone in your house to either use the restroom or make a private call or grab a, a drink of water or something like that? Or is it best to really keep people um, outside your immediate family, outside your home during these gatherings? Yeah, I think that should be fine. I think, um, you know, somebody coming in to make a call, um, you know, this day where people tend to have their own cell phones, I think that should be fine. Um, if they're going to be using a private phone that you have in your house, I would just want to make sure that that phone is cleaned down before somebody else uses it. Um, in terms of using the bathroom, I think that's fine. Uh, you would just want to make sure that, um, again, people are uh, have access to good hand soap and water and uh, alcohol-based hand sanitizer. Um, and then after um, at the end of the day, I would want to make sure that it's able to be cleaned well uh, before it becomes your family's bathroom again. Um, so I think that should be fine. I probably wouldn't want a lot of people gathering in the house at one time, though. No, it might be hard. Um, it might be hard for you to categorize this, but are, are you able to, in, in general, say whether outdoor barbecues, in your opinion, are kind of a low, medi low medium, or high risk activity? Um, that's a hard one. Um, I think, again, the things I think about is it's not so much of um, 
uh, you have to think about a number of things, right? You need to think about the number of people you're going to have. You need to think about uh, the activities that um, you're going to be doing. You need to think about the risk factors of uh, all the people that are going to be there. So it's, you know, I would say a high risk barbecue would be one where you have a small backyard and you're trying to have, I don't know, 15, 20 people there. So they're going to all be very close quarters. Um, I would say a low risk barbecue would be one where maybe you have in that same space uh, five or six people and everyone's wearing a mask and they're appropriately distanced. And so it's, it's very hard, uh, I think, to compare uh, those two situations where one is high risk and one is maybe a little bit more low risk. So that's why you have to think about all these things. Sure. That's, that's really helpful. Um, moving on to the next summer activity, water activities are often synonymous with summer. What are the risks associated with going to public beaches, pools, or lakes? Sure. Um, I think, again, it's a lot of the things that we've been talking about. So if you're going to go to a beach or a lake or a pool, it's, again, trying to maintain as much as you can uh, your distance from other people that are not in your immediate family or social circle that you're going with. Uh, um, especially, you know, this is easier at a beach or a lake. Um, you know, so if you're at a beach, uh, maybe uh, sectioning off an area that you're with, with your uh, family with, and um, when you go into the water, um, you know, same thing. Uh, and I think um, being careful about those things. Um, people are not going to wear masks in the water um, and actually if your mask gets wet that's not going to be helpful. So that's understandable but I think it's really trying to maintain your distance and maintaining good hand hygiene, um, right? There's not anywhere really good to wash your hands um, when you're out on the beach or the lake or at the pool. So taking hand sanitizer with you um, and making sure um, when you get out of the water and you're on the beach um, or on the lake or pool, uh, using the hand sanitizer um, as much as possible and trying to be mindful about not touching your face or your nose or your eyes um, because uh, those are ways that the virus can get into uh, your body and infect you. Um, and then especially at the swimming pools, which is a little bit of a different um, uh, place because you have the bathrooms and the showers. Um, so being very, you know, being careful there um, to not auto infect yourself. Um, again, staying away from uh, uh, people as much as possible. I think some pools have uh, certain restrictions on how many people can be there at a time um, to try and limit uh, the crowding in those areas because those are more circumscribed areas. Is there a difference in risk between indoor pools and outdoor pools? So I would say an indoor pool area would have a little bit more of a risk. Um, I don't know that that's necessarily been proven by any scientific study yet, but just from, you know, thinking about uh, it being an enclosed area. Um, so I would, you know, personally, I would probably favor an outdoor pool area where you can um, spread out a little bit more, again, keep to your family or your uh, social circle a little bit more, um, that would be my inclination. Do we know if chlorinated water or if salt water kills the virus? Um, I believe the chlorinated water should kill the virus. So being in the pool in and of itself should not be a problem. Okay. I'm not sure about the salt water. What about boating or kayaking or whitewater rafting? We had a, a few members um, write in about um, some trips in, involving boating and those types of activities. Yeah, yeah so it would be the same uh, recommendation. Um, so where I am here in California, um, uh, they've allow, started to allow things like, like kayaking and things like that, but typically um, limiting it to one person per kayak. Um, uh, so I would recommend, again, if you're going to do those types of activities, to limit uh, yourself to uh, the number of people possible. Um, so if possible, one person, maybe two, but really try and limit the number of people, uh, again, because 
um, you know, those, those types of activities can be, tend to be in close quarters. So um, obviously I understand people don't want to go boating or kayaking or doing those types of activities by themselves, but I would try and limit the number of people that you have. Families are um, wondering now whether they should be postponing their vacations this year. How risky is travel right now? Yeah, so I think that's a really, another really tough question. I think there are a lot of things you need to think about. Um, we're starting to see uh, numbers go up really all over the country with the lifting of public health measures. And um, the numbers that we're seeing now really reflect uh, what happened over Memorial Day. And I suspect we're going to see numbers continue to go up, um, especially with the recent uh, protests that have happened over the last few weeks and continue to be ongoing. And I think there are a number of things people need to think about. I, you need to think about, first off, what's going on in your community. So what do the numbers look like in your community? Um, are they stable? Are they going down? Are they going up? Um, so that's one thing to think about. The other thing you need to think about is what do the numbers look like in the place you're going to be going to? Are the numbers there um, going down, stable, going up? Um, the one thing I tell everybody um, is you need to think about what you're going to be doing when you go to the place. Um, you know, people you're going to be interacting, the events you're going to be doing, um, and where you're going to be staying. Um, the other thing you need to think about is also you need to think about what if the place I'm going to be at, would I be okay if all of a sudden I became locked down over there? Would I be okay with being, um, having to be quarantined there? Would I be okay with if I got sick and I had to be hospitalized there? You need to think about all those potential contingency plans um, and prepare adequately. Uh, so my personal recommendation to people would be, you know, if you, you think about those things and you wouldn't be okay with it um, to plan accordingly. Um, I also try to advise people uh, to potentially consider not straying too far from home. Um, I don't think that this is the year to stray too far from home. Uh, so there are a lot of great ways you can travel and potentially go um, on road trips, uh, you know, in your car. You know, I think traveling by car is much safer than traveling by air right now or traveling by train. Um, so, you know, where can, where can you travel by car? Um, and there's a lot of wonderful, beautiful places to see in uh, the United States, um, especially where you guys are in the Midwest. So thinking about all those things um, when you make a travel plan. Is there a difference in risk between staying at a hotel or resort versus camping? Well, um, again, maybe not necessarily in regards to COVID-19, um, but I think of other risks. Um, so when you're camping, you have to think about uh, infections like uh, Giardia that come from the water and other parasitic infections that come from the water. Um, so those are not um, comparing apples. It's like comparing apples and oranges. Um, and in the summer, you have to really think about tick-related infections and um, other bacterial infections. Um, so uh, you, there's a different set of things you need to think about if you're camping versus if you're staying in a hotel. Um, when you're staying in a hotel, um, a lot of hotels have now implemented various um, infection control measures in regards to COVID. I still recommend that people when they travel to make sure to take hand sanitizer, disinfection wipes, um, so you can yourself uh, clean uh, high touch places uh, to make sure they've been uh, properly cleaned. Things like remote controls, uh, light switches, uh, faucets, um, things that have potentially been touched by other people, um, which hopefully have been cleaned well by the housekeeping staff, but you can also uh, go over once by yourself. That's a really good suggestion. Um... A member wrote in with a specific question. She's going to be visiting a high altitude location. Any additional precautions related to COVID-19 that she should be taking? Um, no, there shouldn't be any additional precautions related to COVID-19. Um, I would be more concerned related to the high altitude and uh, uh, regarding um, 
that and how that could affect the person. Um, and I would recommend talking to her physician to see uh, the things that she could do to mediate uh, the potential side effects of being at the high altitude. Another common question with, with vacations is, is eating at restaurants. Should we, would it be safer for us to be renting um, places with kitchens so we can cook our own food versus eating out? Um, so I think um, it's always safer to eat at home and you know, you know what you're cooking, you know what infection control methods that uh, you've taken. Uh, that being said, I think if you're going to be vacationing and you're going to be out, it's always nice to support the local economy. Um, and uh, you want to try and do that, right? And so, and that's one of the reasons we go on vacation is so we're not uh, uh, doing all the things we do at home, right? Um, and I think there are things you can do to uh, eat out and be safe. Um, again, I think making sure that the place you're eating is um, uh, taking the appropriate precautions. Uh, you know, servers are wearing masks. Um, uh, you're not using or eating from communal types of um, uh, dishes. So like bread baskets, things like that, chip bas uh, uh, baskets of chips. Um, so I think those types of things help. Um, a lot of places have now moved to using disposable menus or using um, uh, uh, online menu, so uh, you're not getting menus that have been reused multiple times, um, making sure that uh, your silverware and your plates have not been sitting there for long periods of time. Uh, so I think um, taking a look at what kinds of methods the places you are using um, uh, or you're eating at have been using. The other thing you can do also is if you don't feel comfortable eating out is ordering the food and bringing it back to wherever you're staying. If you do really want to eat out and the restaurant has both indoor seating and a patio, um, an outside option, is it safer to eat on the patio versus indoors? Yes, I would definitely recommend eating outdoors. Um, the ventilation is better. Uh, we have definitely seen uh, reports of uh, cases that have been spread indoors. Um, there was a case uh, series that came out from China uh, earlier this year that showed how um, cases of COVID spread indoors. So I would definitely recommend uh, if you're going to eat out to sit out on the patio. And depending on where you might be in the country, a number of places have not even opened for uh, indoor seating as of yet. That's really helpful. Um, summer is often a time for celebrations like graduation parties, weddings, family reunions, and birthday parties. Should we be attending or hosting events like these? So I think this is again your, where you're, um, you have to assess your own risk um, and think about uh, not just your own risk, but the risk of the people that might be coming. And um, I think that uh, ideally you would want to keep anything that you're going to have to extremely small numbers um, and try to figure out the best way to be creative during this time. I know that it's, um, this is a hard time for everybody. Um, trying to adjust during this time has been very challenging, but I think that there are a lot of creative ways to have um, these types of celebrations, um, graduation parties, um, reunions, uh, celebrate, celebrate the 4th of July. Um, you know, here in my city um, where they did the graduation, they had um, drive-by graduation parades for all the graduating seniors. And while it's not the optimal thing in some ways, um, because it's different, it will have a special memory for the people who graduated. And I think trying to come up with ways to embrace that um, difference that we're having to live through at this time and uh, trying to think about that. So, you know, while again, not optimal, I think trying to think about those things and how we can have um, different types of gatherings. And if you feel intent on having an in-person gathering, I'd really caution you to try to think about how you can do it safely uh, with the least amount of 
people because there have been numerous reports over and over again of gatherings which have led to um, people, numerous people getting coronavirus. Um, and we don't want that to happen. One thing that some of my neighbors have done and I've read of others doing as well is establishing a core group of friends and families that you'll choose to get together with and celebrate with, with the understanding that those families are not getting together with others. Is that helpful at all? So um, I think in theory, it's a great idea. I would just be cautious because the larger your group is, the greater chance it is that somebody might deviate from that group. And so I would definitely think about how well you know people and also think about the chance that somebody might deviate from that uh, social bubble, so to speak. Because if somebody deviates, then there's a chance that they could get sick and then bring that into that group. And so um, I always uh, discuss that with people to make sure that they understand what the potential risk is. Those are some great considerations to take into account. Um, thank you. I wanted to quickly run through some daily activities that um, patients have been emailing in about. Um, these aren't those fun summer activities, but some essential things that, that families are wondering if they can get back to. Um, the first one, getting your hair cut or colored. Is it okay to be doing that now? Yeah, so I think um, uh, that's, that's a tough one actually. So I think if you're gonna do those things, um, you want to make sure that both yourself and the person who's doing uh, the coloring or the cut uh, is uh, taking the appropriate precautions. So uh, again, wearing a mask. Um, uh, ideally, the person who's going to be cutting or coloring your hair may even be wearing a face shield. Uh, so I feel uh, people's pain. I haven't been able to get my hair cut or colored, and so I'm still holding off on that. So if you can, maybe um, if you want your hair colored, uh, try and do that at home uh, for a little bit. Um, but I think, again, if you're going to do those things, uh, taking some appropriate precautions. What about attending religious services? A lot of um, churches and other religious institutions have started having um, services in some communities in a limited capacity. Others are continuing to stay online. What about these in-person um, religious services? Yeah, so I, I really think that this w would be the time to continue to follow religious services online. Um, I don't think that attending religious services in person would be the best idea. Um, again, because you'd be in a large crowded setting um, if you were to attend them and that increases your risk of being exposed. And we know, um, again, from numerous other uh, ancillary reports of people being infected with coronavirus uh, from religious settings, uh, that's in fact what led to um, a large outbreak in South Korea. So I think right now, again, since we're still seeing um, uh, infections uh, on the rise in a number of places, I would recommend uh, trying to uh, do online religious services if you can. Um, we've had a couple questions about taking public transportation or leaving your car with a valet. What are your mm -hmm. thoughts on those things? Yeah, so um, if you have to take public transportation. Um, I would recommend wearing a mask. Um, and also taking hand sanitizer with you and being careful. Um, there are some things you can do to mediate the risk on public transportation. Uh, trying to sit in an area where um, there's not a lot of people, uh, trying to sit next to a window and see if you can open it, if it's on a bus or something like that. Um, those would be my best recommendations. Um, again, also trying to take a uh, a, the shortest route possible as well, so to limit your time and also trying to take uh, the public transportation when um, the, uh, it would not be the most crowded or an off-peak hour if you can. Um, so again, it's all about trying to mediate your risk the best way possible. I think um, the question with the valet is a challenging one. I would um, 
the, the risk in that one, I think, would actually be more with the valet than for you. Um, so uh, we've actually had this conversation quite a bit is, you know, um, we do know that if you're someone who's been coughing um, and you're infected with coronavirus, that um, it can aerosolize in the air and be present there for a bit. And so then if a valet got in there to park your car, then um, they could get infected. Likewise, if a valet got into the car and they were coughing and not wearing a mask, um, they could uh, have their infectious droplets be aerosolized in the air and then you got in the car, you could breathe those in. So for the time being, I would probably recommend trying to self-park your car if you can um, until, again, we have a better understanding of the transmission dynamics of the disease and also uh, things get a little bit more under control. That's helpful, thank you. Um, shopping malls are starting to open up, in, at least in some communities. Um, by me, they're, they just recently opened up. Um, also curious, you know, about grocery shopping, should we continue to get delivery um, and curbside pickup, or is it okay to start going into the grocery store ag again and going into malls? Yeah, um, I think that in terms of grocery shopping, I think that, those are, you know, obviously necessities. And um, if you can go into the grocery store um, during, again, off-peak hours, trying to remain uh, physically distanced, uh, making sure that you're using good hand hygiene and wearing a mask, I think that that type of activity is fine. Um, and I think, uh, for the most part, grocery stores are doing a really good job of trying to um, make sure that they don't get crowded and they're also being really good about making sure that people are using hand sanitizer when they go in. The other thing I would recommend is with the grocery store, if you're going to be using a cart or a basket to try and take um, a disinfection wipe and uh, clean it down before you use it. A lot of places are offering these, but it never hurts to carry those with you. Um, and then you know, the same thing with if you're going to go to a mall. Um, I think those same uh, types of uh, rules and um, practices I would apply. You don't want to be going somewhere that's going to be crowded and have a lot of people, and you don't want to end up in a store with a bunch of people um, at the same time. So I would try and uh, use those same types of um, uh, guidelines. What about working out at an indoor gym and or attending group fitness activities? Um, if we do these things, should we be wearing masks for, for these activities? Um, so I think with those types of activities, again, this is a situation where um, not all activities are the same. Uh, first of all, if uh, there was a recent study that came out that showed if you were doing some sort of low intensity activity, something like yoga or Pilates um, was a lot safer in terms of transmission of disease than if you're going to be doing high intensity cardio. And the reason is, is that when you're doing something like running or, you know, being on an elliptical machine, you're breathing much harder. So in essence, it's uh, putting air under pressure. So you're forcefully going to be breathing out any potential infectious droplets. So uh, my first recommendation would be um, it, it, if you're going to do something that's low intensity, um, that, that's going to be much safer. Um, if you're going to be in a gym doing something like running, um, you're going to need to maintain much greater physical distance. Um, that being said, it's not very reasonable to be wearing a mask when you're running. So I would recommend if you're going to do something like running to try and do it outside um, rather than in a gym. If you're in a gym and you're doing something like lifting weights or something like that, I would definitely make sure to try and remain um, as far away as possible from somebody who's doing um, physical exertional exercise. Um, and I would definitely recommend wearing a mask. Thank you, Dr. Krupali, this has been so helpful. We'd now like to switch gears a bit and talk about summer activities for children. We have to think not only about the risks of kids with autoimmune liver disease contracting COVID-19, 
but the risk of healthy kids bringing the virus home and passing it on to adult kids. So this next segment is relevant for anyone with young kids at home, whether or not these kids have autoimmune liver disease. So I'm now going to turn it over to Chris Browner, an incredible partner and advocate for patients and families with liver disease, and, and she'll be interviewing Dr. Capelli about summer activities for kids. Chris, thank you so much for being here. Yeah, thank you very much for allowing me to participate in this. And um, Dr. Kapali, I'm really excited. I have five children of my own um, and I'm really excited to hear um, some good advice because I think a lot of parents that I talk to are struggling with making some decisions right now. Um, and I'll just come out of the gate and um, talk about daycare. Um, a lot of parents are going back to work and um, are excited to sort of get things back to normal routine. And I'm wondering what kind of advice you have and is it safe for parents to send their kids back to daycare? Sure, that's a really uh, tough one. Um, I can only empathize with people on that one. Um, I think that, uh, again, that's gonna be one where you have to think about uh, your risk factors. Because as you know, or as this has been discussed, um, this is one of those situations where uh, we know that children tend to not have as many of the signs and symptoms of COVID, so we don't necessarily know when a child may have the disease. Um, so I think this is one of those situations where with children going back to daycare, we need to be very um, mindful of making sure kids are we're teaching our kids um, how to practice good hand hygiene, which I know can be challenging with children, and um, you know, being very good with uh, practicing good hand hygiene and disinfection practices at home to try and prevent any transmission. Um, we also need to be um, good at doing things like disinfecting any toys they might be using. Um, so if that gets um, uh, the virus on it that they're not, you know, putting those toys in their mouth and um, potentially getting themselves infected. Um, you know, I think we're still learning a lot about uh, the transmission dynamics from children um, to adults and things like that. So, um, you know, I think, uh, again, these are, this is one of those things where I don't have a lot of great advice. Um, and I think you have to uh, try and be as mindful as possible of the things that you can mediate. Any thoughts on um, kids wearing masks? Yeah, um, I think that um, it's, a, it's a good idea. Um, you know, I, I'm not a mother of my own, but I uh, can imagine that it's very hard to have kids wear masks all the time and leave them on and not touch them. So I think it's great to try, but you know, the other thing you have to think about is when you have a child wearing a mask is, um, you know, we, we tell people all the time, once you wear your mask, you need to wash your hands before you take it off. And I would imagine that it's really hard to have a child not fiddle with that mask and auto-infect it. So um, again, I think it's a great idea, uh, but I think also we have to be realistic about things too. Yeah, it's hard for me not to fiddle with my mask and I'm not a right. child when I'm wearing it. So I, I, I appreciate I that pro time. problem. Yeah, I have yeah. a hard time with that as well. So, um, yeah. and I've been doing this for many years, so <laughs> I get it. Well, I'm glad I'm not alone in that. Um, what about uh, parents, uh, advice for parents who want to bring a sitter um, into the house? Yeah, um, I think that that's, you know, I, I have friends who've been doing that, um, you know, and it, it goes back to the idea of kind of having like a, a closed circle, so to speak. Um, so I have um, friends who have, um, or multiple friends, right? They have one sitter for multiple children. Um, and I don't think that that's a bad idea if you can afford that. Um, because then again, it's limiting the number of people who are um, in contact with uh, your child and you kind of have a little bit of a more controlled environment. Um, that being said, you know, you need to have a good idea of what the sitter or nanny, um, what they're doing um, to make sure that they're not putting themselves at risk for getting infected and then potentially infecting your child, your family, um, all that. So I don't think that's a bad idea if you can afford it, but a lot of people can't. Sure, sure. Um, okay, 
we've I've talked to parents who are really curious about summer camps as well. Day camps that are maybe opening up and then um, the any sleepaway camps. Any thoughts on that? Sure. Um, I think that this is another one of those situations that depends on the camp, what the kids are going to be doing, um, how many kids are going to be at the camp. And then I think you also got to think about um, the different types of uh, infection control practices they're going to be doing. Um, you know, sleep away camps, you have to think about um, how many kids are going to be in a room together, um, what types of practices they're going to be using to um, try and make sure the kids don't get infected. Uh, so you have to look at all those different things. Um, I'm sure parents love the idea of kids going to summer camp right about now. Um, so Again, I think um, there are ways to do these things that you you that are um, safe. Um, you're, and I think also everyone has to think about what their um, tolerance for risk is. Um, mm -hmm. Nothing is going to be no risk, right? So again, you have to think about um, you know, okay, well, something like maybe art camp is going to be less risky than football camp where the kids are like tackling each other or something, right? So you have to think about mm -hmm. those types of things. Um, and uh, again, every parent is going to have a different tolerance for risk. Well, I think that's really good advice. And I see that with my friends, just even on summer are a little bit more risk tolerant than others. But you bring up a really good point, which is organized sports when you talk about football. Um, a lot of schools are starting to have practices, even summer trainings. Um, I see it when I drive around the neighborhoods. Um, any thoughts on um, organized sports at this point? Yeah, so, you know, I think, um, I think the sports that are less uh, contact um, would be the ones that I would feel more comfortable with. Um, and ones like things like tennis and swimming, um, where you really don't have contact, are the ones that I would feel most comfortable with. Um, you know, I think that things like uh, tackle football, uh, rugby, things like that, where you're just right up in each other. Um, I think, personally, I would feel more comfortable waiting. Um, I think that, you know, we're in a situation, like I said, we're seeing cases continuing to go up. In a, a number of places in the country, I think those cases are going to continue to go up uh, as we begin to see uh, the um, numbers reflective of the protests. And um, so I think that while I completely understand the desire for people to want to try and get back to the way things were, I do think that we are unfortunately um, going to have to adjust to what this new normal is. and. Um, I think we also need to um, try and be as safe as possible. Um, everybody has a different threshold, um, but we also know that children may not manifest uh, signs and symptoms of the disease um, like adults do, and it would be really uh, hard for, I think, a lot of people if their child was infected, they didn't know the child was infected, and that child went on and um, uh, infected a loved one. And that person got very sick. And I, but I also think those are things you need to think about, right? So if you're living in a, a family that has, um, you know, your grandparents and the child living with each other, um, that is something you really do need to think about. Um, so there are a lot of factors that need to be considered um, when you're making these types of decisions. You know, whether we're talking about young children or teenagers, um, their peers are a really important part of their life and social emotional development. Um, and so we've gotten some questions I know from parents about um, play dates, you know, and continuing that um, social emotional sort of interaction um, when social distancing is pretty much impossible with little ones. Um, mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, um, I think that trying to facil facilitate um, uh, social interactions is really important. And I really think it's important to um, point out that there's a difference between social distancing and physical distancing. 
you know, physical distancing is maintaining the physical distance. And you can be socially involved with people without having to be close to them, right? And I think that's a very important thing that I've um, tried to hammer home quite a bit. Uh, so I think, um, you know, early on in this outbreak, um, talking to parents and other people about things that can be done. I think that, um, you know, yes, we have electronic media and we can try and set up um, phone calls and Zoom chats and all that, but that gets old after a while. Um, I think if your children are gonna wanna maintain those um, connections, trying to facilitate things that are more outdoors rather than indoors, um, where they can play outside, that's gonna be safer. Um, I think, um, you know, there are other things that can be done. Um, uh, if they play video games, you can try and do that like online. Like I know there's some video games that can be done like virtually and remotely where they still kind of have that social interaction. Um, uh, and trying to find things that can be done where they can remain socially connected, um, even though they're maintaining their physical distance. Um, and it's, it's hard, it's definitely not easy. Um, you know, I talk about for when I was living overseas and trying to remain connected to my friends, um, uh, you know, I would find a movie and watch it online while they were on the other end and we would like talk about it. And those were little things that we could do um, that made things helpful. We would find, um, I used to play like an online game called Words with, Words with Friends with them and that helped a little bit. Um, again, not, the ideal situation, but it was something that helped. It's time to get creative is what you're saying, right? With all this? Yeah, definitely time to get creative. Yes. Um, oh, Erin earlier uh, was when I was talking to her earlier, she was talking about playgrounds and how she's been taking her kids to the park. And of course, if there's a big play set, they're going to run right towards it. Are play, are play sets safe for children right now? I think as long as there's not a lot of other kids around, I think they're fine. I think, again, it goes back to really making sure that um, you're using good hand hygiene, um, right? You don't want your kids um, playing all over a playground and then, you know, using their hands that are dirty to uh, rub their eyes or rub their nose or their mouth, right? So I think as long as you're making sure that they're washing their hands or using alcohol-based hand sanitizer, um, I think they should be fine. Again, if there's, you know, 50 kids at the playground, um, you know, that might not be the best time to have them be there as well. So while I don't have little children have to worry about playgrounds, I do have older children who are um, wanting to have jobs, of course. So going back to one of them is a server at a restaurant. Um, one of them likes to babysit. And I really struggle on whether um, that is a, a responsible decision for me to make of whether I should allow them to do that. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah. Um, so I think the one who is a server, um, you know, I think that uh, I would assume that the restaurant has also started to implement certain um, safety guidelines. So one would hope that they would have them, you know, wearing a mask. Um, and trying to maintain some distance from the guests when they come into the restaurant. Um, I think as long as they're doing that, that should be fine. I think the biggest risk to them is, um, you know, when they're taking um, the orders, which every restaurant's doing things a little bit different now. Um, and then really when they're picking up the used food trays. And I think as long as they're, when they're picking up the used uh, food plates and they're um, busting them back, as long as they're making sure to use good um, hand hygiene uh, after they do that, I think that they should be fine. Um, and then the babysitting, again, I think is, it comes back down again to, you know, I would probably want um, the babysitter to wear, wear, wear a mask um, to make sure that they're safe and, again, making sure to use good um, hand hygiene. It really comes back down to those two things. Um, and I think the mask is, you know, to protect them as much as it is to protect the kids. Yes, those are good. That's some good advice. Um, 
I've also talked to some parents whose children, these are older children who are interested in participating in some of the protests in March that are going on around the country. Um, what's your thought yeah. on the safety of that right now? Yeah, um, I mean, obviously um, the protests in March are important. Um, racism is just as much as a public health issue as um, infectious disease are. Um, and I think if people are going to protest and they want to protest, it's really important for them to do so safely. So um, if they're going to do it, I recommend that people wear a mask, um, they wear goggles or some sort of eye protection, um, and also, you know, again, carry hand sanitizer to try and keep their hands clean as much as possible. Um, ideally, if they're going to uh, protest also, I would recommend that they write their slogan that they're going, that they would ideal, that they would want to chant, they write it out on like a poster board um, rather than chanting it because when you're chanting it, um, those droplets are going to spread. And if they want to make, and then, you know, hold it, hold it up and then use a noise maker or a drum to make noise. Um, I would also say that if you're going to protest to try and keep your distance um, a bit from the like the crowd, right? So people trying to physically distance themselves. Um, I would also say that you know try to carry like some saline drops or something in your pocket in case the police use tear gas because um, if they do, it's very irritating to the eyes and it makes you cough. So um, we don't want you rubbing your eyes or your nose or anything. So if that happens, then um, to wash your hands with hand sanitizer, and then you can put the um, saline drops in your eyes, that'll help. Um, and if, and then also, if you are gonna protest, as soon as you come home, you know, take a shower, put your clothes in the laundry, um, and also uh, physically distance yourself from other family members because you don't wanna get them sick. And then I would recommend getting tested um, at seven to 14 days later. Okay. Thank you for that. And Dr. Polly, is there anything that, um, any questions you've been getting that Aaron and I didn't um, ask that you want to touch on at all? Anything else? Um, I think it's more statement. Um, I think that I really want to emphasize to people that I know it feels like we've been in this pandemic for a really long time. And I know that people are starting to get tired of uh, the recommendations to physically distance, to wash their hands, and to use good hand hygiene. Um, but I really just want to encourage people to continue to do those things. Uh, we want to make sure that people remain safe and they remain healthy. Um, and it takes everybody to do these things to try and um, combat this pandemic. And so, um, I know it seems like it's been going on forever, but uh, if we all continue to do these things, it will help us um, fight this pandemic and try and get back to whatever our new normal is going to be sooner. Thank you. Those are some really wise words and I think um, will help guide a lot of the people that are watching this webinar to, as they make some um, important decisions this summer and move on. So I appreciate you being here and I'm gonna go ahead and pass it back to um, Dr. Lambert. Great, thank you. Thank you, Chris and Dr. Kupali, and thank you for joining us again today. Again, a very special thank you to Dr. Kritika Kupali with the San Francisco Department of Health for giving us an excellent foundation of working coronavirus knowledge that we can all implement this summer. Thank you to the collaborators of the AIHA, specifically the Center for Autoimmune Liver Disease and Cincinnati Children's Hospital. We hope you'll join us again in two weeks for our next webinar. See you then.